these are desperate times, these are dangerous times. They'll be doing as much as they can and working incredibly hard and it won't be enough to get it under control. We want to go into the, into the treatment center. Would that be possible? Well, if you want to, but if I were your brother. So we're headed into a Redemption Hospital right now, which is sort of in the belly of the beast here with the outbreak. Um, it was supposed to be a holding center, but it turned into a treatment center because patients had, had nowhere to go. We headed in to meet the medical director, Dr. Mohamed Sango, who had been overseeing all efforts against Ebola. So, so did you build this all? We built it. We built this when the, when the outbreak started? We just did a few days when, oh, they, when, when they decided that they would have Okay, holding place there. Oh, because you weren't a holding center until holding recently. Center. We found out that this holding center is, instead of going in hours, it's going in days. Patients are there languishing without taking them, you know, to the, to the right, rightful place. And was your staff, I mean, were they trained to handle this stuff before the outbreak started? No. no. Yeah. For this particular outbreak, of course, they were trained to some extent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the practical aspect, you know, not the theoretical aspect. You see, the theoretical training, and the practical trick, they are different. It's one thing in the classroom, one thing one in the field. It's one thing in the classroom, one thing in the <laughs> yeah. inside there. Yeah. What are you going to do inside there? Redemption Hospital, which is typically a free clinic, was only supposed to be a holding center for Ebola patients before they headed elsewhere for treatment. When patients started flooding in, however, it became a de facto treatment center trying to cope with the influx as best it could. The healthcare workers that you have that are treating these patients, psychologically, what they've seen the past few months, uh, it's got to be very, very hard on them. So we have had series of death of our health workers. A lot of them have died. You can see the difference between, between a, 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 a developing country and a developed country like America. If you have Ebola in America and all the rest of it, all of those cases that went to America, none of them died. Do you know why? It is not because the virus per se. It is because of the way they handle the management of the disease. The medical infrastructure there is... Sure. Yeah. Number one, able to calculate to the least how much of fluid lost by this patient. Able to calculate to the least how much of electrolyte and what kind of electrolyte that is lost and then replaced. And you don't have that capability here. The capability is little or none at all. I've never seen such a thing. The case is all over. In a rampant way, it's difficult. So difficult to contain this. We need helpers. We need those who, who, have, who have experienced such pandemic before to come to our aid. How are you coping emotionally? Uh, uh, how are you coping? I have to cope. I have to cope with the stress. I have to cope with the emotion. Or not, if not so, I will be a victim of circumstances. I always tell them, if you think so much about the disease and become frightened, what you're supposed to do to protect you, you cannot make it. You will not think. You will not think wisely. With the fear of that, when the fear consumes you, then the disease equally consumes you. So you have to be alert. You have to be alert at all times. No sleeping on the disease. No sleeping on your emotions. Would it be possible to follow you around on camera Definitely. and just get you around? But Definitely. should we get cutaways? But just... there are certain areas that you can go. Yeah. I mean, we have, we have PPE suits if you need us to put those on. You want to go into the EPI? You want to go into the, into the treatment center? Would that be possible? Well, if you want. If I were your brother. Because when you go there, listen carefully. Yeah. When you go there first and foremost, you become you become infected and you become infectious. Until you take those things off. And in taking those things off, let me let me let me let me advise you. If you make a mistake in taking those things off, this those infected materials, that's how you hear that. So my dear, let me tell you. Just see what you can. Go back home and meet your family again. We heeded the doctor's advice and decided not to enter the treatment center. Instead, we headed back to MSF. 
who had recently started taking in patients again. So we're at the MSF clinic right now. They have about 160 beds here, and that's not enough at all. You know, they're, they're doing the best they can, but people keep coming in and out. Last week, there were 100 survivors they were able to transfer out. But the worry right now is that this, this thing is increasing exponentially, and it's going to keep growing and growing and growing. How hard is it for you guys to turn people away at the gate that you know are sick and need help? That's the worst things that we have to do uh, on a daily basis. Also, with this specific uh, disease, we, uh, we have the risk of spreading uh, when they go home. That's why we give the, the kit. It's one of the worst things. And, and what is also very difficult is that we don't know when it's going to stop. Because as long as there is not enough bed capacity in the, in the city, we will have to continue to do it. Behind me right here is the MSF gate where people line up to get in. So every morning, you know, they come out here around 8, 8.30, and judging by the people who have died last night and the people that have been released because, you know, they, they've stopped showing symptoms, that's how many people they can let in. And the people at the gate have to do a sort of triage where they see the sickest people. They let them in, they follow down this road right here, and you can see the seats down there where they, they, they await sort of the next step in the treatment that they're gonna get. How does it feel being a Liberian person and watching your country go through this, seeing your fellow citizens in here in these camps and, and there not being enough help for them right now? Well, um, to say the least, this is an emotional period for me and every Liberian. And so every day to see our brothers and sisters turn up at hospitals and they cannot be taken in simply because um, these facilities do not have the space, it's really emotional, it's heartbreaking. It's been almost two months since I last stopped going to see my mother and my daughter who's been in time with her. Because I just feel that um, these are desperate times, these are dangerous times. James is waiting for his test results to come back today. Uh, and then Dominic and him will find out if they get to go home. Sophie told us about Dominic, who had tested positive for Ebola and recovered. When his three-year-old nephew James was diagnosed as well, Dominic decided to come back to the clinic and help him recover. There is strong scientific evidence that once someone survives Ebola, they are immune to the strain with which they were infected. And you made the choice to come back in and take care of him. You weren't scared. Well, when I was sick, yeah. there were other people around. I took the risks. To help? I came to me, talked to me, advised me, encouraged me. So I think that I got a strength. I can do it for other people as well. Later that night, young James's test results came back negative. He had been cured of Ebola, and him and Dominic were able to leave the clinic. James is that clinic's youngest ever Ebola survivor. And it's just day after day after day of more people coming and coming and coming. Yeah. The difficulty for our staff as well is that people are working incredibly hard. And we're trying to scale up as fast as we can, but uh, you know, we know that, that by ourselves, we'll never be enough to actually get this outbreak under control. So, yeah, people are making that horrendous choice of turning people away who need healthcare every day. And then, uh, yeah, they're seeing people die and, you know, does it, numbers too. Does it feel sometimes like you're fighting a losing battle of sorts? I think that uh, that's part of that makes it very difficult for people, that they'll be doing as much as they can and working incredibly hard and it won't be enough to get it under control. So as we've seen here at MSF and among the local Liberians that we've hung out with that are, are combating this thing, Everyone's really doing all they can, you know, no one really has the capabilities, the infrastructure isn't in place, and no one really expected it to get this bad and to, for the epidemic to grow so quickly. There's hope that with the influx of U.S. troops helping with the building of additional treatment centers, and the international community finally paying attention, the spread of Ebola in Liberia can be slowed. Some, however, feel the international community has responded too late, and it will now take a much bigger effort to get the outbreak under control.